to celebrate with one another, to celebrate the graduates, and to be able to say a word on behalf of those uh, children and young people that are moving on to a, a new grade. They are truly in the commencement spirit, for they're looking forward to what's next. And comm commencement, though we uh, say it and, and, and though we share it at graduation time as though it's an ending, commencement means a new beginning. Amen? And how many of us know the importance of a new beginning? If you know the importance of a new beginning, give God a hand praise right now. A new beginning. And in celebrating new beginnings, we acknowledge that Jesus shared with us this mighty message today that you are the light of the world. Now, I want you to find a neighbor to shake hands with. I don't care how far they are in the sanctuary from you. But when you get to them, say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, you're a flashlight just like me. Mm -hmm. Flashlight. Neon light. Flashlight. Amen. You are the light of the world. Would you pray with me? My God, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help. I know if you withdraw your hand from me, I don't know where I'd go. Now in the name of the creator of the Christ and the Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, the hearts of all those gathered here, may it all be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, as we together consider the message, the final message in this mighty series, this series on the sermons of the narrow path, the teachings of Jesus for today. We ask for a today, right now, embrace of this message, O oh God, in this moment for your people. We pray for it in Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. I want to tell you today about Deacon Shirley Ellis. Deacon Shirley Ellis is our subject today, and just want to share with you a bit about her. She, she had a career in corporate America. The honors she gained in that career were wonderful. The financial security she had in her job in corporate America over some 35 years or so that she worked in her position and was promoted routinely and regularly gave her a sense of financial peace every now and then, if not uh, fairly often. She had security in that job. And her ego was certainly stroked in that job. And so Shirley really felt like she was doing what she needed to do for the Lord and for everyone who knew her. The week after Deacon Ellis uh, retired from that long stint, uh, 35 years in her corporate job, the week after, her, 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 her pastor came to her and asked her, if she would be interested in teaching a Bible class. Well, Shirley hesitated a bit. She didn't say yes right off. How many of you have had the feeling you shouldn't say yes right off? Amen? But eventually she did say yes. And, and when she began teaching that Bible class, Shirley felt a joy come over her like she had never felt in her life before. She found out that she really, really enjoyed doing this teaching of the Bible class. And over time, as she taught more and more of the classes, she became uh, the very best Bible teacher in the church. And she became the most sought after Bible teacher in the church. And she became the kind of Bible teacher that went to other churches to talk about how it was she as a lay person learned how to teach the Bible in such an exemplary, exemplary way. She really got to the place where she could let her light shine as a Bible teacher, amen? It shines so brightly as a Bible teacher that she recognized that it wasn't really her corporate job that had been the thing where she'd been serving God the best. That hers was a God-given gift 
and a divinely appointed destiny as a teacher. And when she was asked what it was that, that, that inspired her, what it was that, that pushed her, what it was that gave her the greatest joy she had ever known, this is what she said. She said, I'd rather teach than eat. Oh, that blew me away this week, y'all, when I found it. The good news today is that is that Deacon Ellis found her way to truly letting her light shine. Somebody say that's all right. She found it teaching. This is Jesus encouragement, though, to all of us, to each and every follower, each and every minister, each and every disciple, each and every person who claims that Christ is your Messiah. The, the call is the same. You've got to let your light shine. Theologians have noted that this first public sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes is also called the Sermon on the Mount. Those are one in the same. Let the church say amen. That this Sermon on the Mount, John was broken down into three parts. Amen broken down into three parts. And this is the first section of those three parts. God has brought us safely through and into the first section of the three parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Part one gives us a charge, a commission, and a calling. You are the light of the world. You are a Christian. And as a Christian, you have more influence on others than you think you do or believe you do. You think you just are tiptoeing around in this world and yet people see you. Amen. Notice with me that Jesus urges the disciples in verse 13 this way. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It goes on, it says, it is no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out or it's trampled underfoot. I don't know about you, but if I'm the salt of the world, I wanna be salty, amen? I don't wanna be some of that salt that's lost its taste, amen? It goes on in verse 14 and says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And, and, and no matter which way you cut it, when you look at it from an English perspective, Jesus is preaching here and preaching in the present tense. Amen. No matter the time you read it or the place you read it in or the generation you're reading it from. As Christians, we are salt and light now. Somebody say now. Now. This is our Savior and our Messiah reminding us of who we're called to be. Now. Not in the way away from now, by and by. Not in heaven on heaven's glorious shore in eternity after we die. We're called now to be salt and light, tasty, if you will, and lit up for the work of our hearts, our hands, and our souls. Living as we do in a post Thomas Edison, you know Thomas Edison, the one who discovered electricity, a post Thomas Edison world where lights are everywhere, where some of the lights right here in our own sanctuary have already burst a couple of the balloons, or at least one of them, amen? It gets too close to the light. We assume that all the lights ought to work. I dare you. We've got so many lights in here. I dare you to just count the number of lights you see right here in this sanctuary. We assume that there should be lights everywhere. And indeed, most of the time there are. Lights everywhere. Lights. When it's easy to turn on the light, we take the light for granted. When there's a switch on the wall and all you have to do is flick it, people forget that when you flick the light on, 
money starts to running. Amen. Go ahead and use that sunlight coming in your window. Amen. If you can, if you can. Most of the time, though, we take light for granted, even at night. Amen. Until you, you, you camp sometime. How many of you have ever camped in the real wilderness? I mean, the real wilderness where it's so dark, you put your hand in front of your face and you can't even see your hand. That's dark. Amen. We need to remember <clears throat> that, 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 that light is not everywhere. It's not placed in every place. And, and we need to appreciate the light when we find the light. Amen. And, 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 and this morning, as much as we love the light, who shall forget the famous statement of our spiritual author and sister, uh, Christian sister Marianne Williamson, who reminded us, as others have, this way. She said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. It's our light. Can you imagine that? Well, Pastor Light, most of the time it makes me feel safe. If there's a lot of light, I feel good. But what Marianne Williamson says is that you've got so much to give, you've got so much to share, that you can be so much more than you already are. You might just be like Deacon Shirley Ellis, who thought she was serving the Lord all those 35 years in her corporate job, in her big wig suits, in her fine shoes that she wore to the office every day, and her stockings on her legs. Amen. But she soon found out after her retirement that she got more satisfaction out of teaching Bible class. See, there's a new part of you, beloved, that might be waiting to emerge. A new part of you that might be waiting to start on the other side of the light. But you've got to go over there to find it. See, the tasty and lit up path to the way to the other side of the light for you and for me is the one that calls us out this 49th anniversary year of the United Church of Montbello, beloved, out from this building that we love so much and love so well, out into the streets and into the neighborhood to meet not just neighbors we know, but new neighbors we've never met before. Tasty and lit up Christians are, are never only concerned, you see, with teachings and Christian doctrines how my faith feels as it rocks around in my head, as I bandy about about who has this label or that label or thinks this or that about what Christianity means. Tasty and little Christians. Influence and impact lives in very real and significant ways. That's why it's so impactful even to watch people become community in the garden or on the farm because their hands are dirty and they're all trying to figure out how to get that same rascal weed. Donna, this is the thing I got. I asked somebody, I asked, I, I asked a scientist here in Colorado, what is a weed? I don't mean cannabis. What are the kind that are, are ripe for plucking? What are the kind that are ripe for picking? And, 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 and the, first, the first thing that, that the scientist said, well, well, can you eat it? If you can eat it, then it's not a weed. Said, is there some usefulness for it? Because it's, if it's useful, maybe it's not a weed. And, and essentially, a weed here in our region, John, in the, in, in, in the, John Green, in, 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 it's not a, a, a weed necessarily in North Carolina. 
There are different weeds out there. Different weeds in Virginia, Henry. Different weeds. Can you imagine? Maybe in God's creation, everything that grows has something of a purpose. Isn't that something to think about? See, tasty and lit up Christians are curious. They, 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 they carry their faith with some moxie. I, I borrow from my friends who are Jewish and, and they, they carry their faith with some chutzpah. That's what we do if we're tasty and lit up Christians. We know folks and we see folks shining and they see us shining. And no matter what they say about us, we just keep shining on. Keep shining. Shine on, beloved. Shine on, fellow Christian traveler. Shine on in the things you do for Christ. Shine on in the new things you'll try for Christ. Also, God always sees. God always knows. When we're shining our light for what's good and what's right. God always sees. Like the good humored boss who was compelled to call her chronically late employee into her office. Somebody say, uh oh. See, when your boss calls you in the office, it's worse than the principal calling you into the office at school. Amen? You don't want that call to come to the office in your work life. Amen. The, 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 the boss said to the employee, it has not escaped my attention that every time there's a home game for the Rockies at Coors Field, amen, you have to take your auntie to the doctor. The employee was a little shocked that the boss was on to what was happening. So the employee responded this way. The employee said, you know, you're, you're right, boss. You don't suppose my auntie is, is faking it, do you? So... See, the moral of the story, beloved, is folks see you. You may think you're tiptoeing in the back. That nobody has noticed when you came in. Amen. You may think you may think that somehow you, 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 you've escaped the, 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 the vision of those that that are always looking to see what you're wearing, what you have on. Oh, come on, somebody. You may think that they don't see that you're present in their world just like they're present in your world, amen? They see you shine. And if they see you shine, then you need to shine brightly. You need to shine like the, the Lord God himself would shine if, if, if Jesus were still on earth, amen? You need to shine and you need to shine brightly and continue to shine in your life. Amen. One of the greatest lights of Christianity, uh, we almost didn't see their shine. I was shocked to find that the story of Charles Wesley, uh, all people who are connected with being Methodists know the name of John Wesley. John Wesley is often credited with being the founder of Methodism. Amen. So because the founders in the family, one of the brothers, Charles, it would, it would have been easy for his life to have been forgotten. But he didn't let it become so. Amen. But we almost never saw his light. Story of his life as I close goes this way. Language scholar Charles Wesley was the 18th, the 18th child of Samuel and Susanna Wesley's 19 children. 
You want to know a prescription for being forgot? Be the 18th of 19. Amen. He was born prematurely in December 1707 and appeared dead, 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 dead. He lay silent, wrapped in wool for weeks. When older, Charles joined his siblings as each day his mother, Susanna, who, who knew Greek, Latin, and French, methodically taught them for six hours. He didn't go to school outside the house. He had enough schooling in the house. Amen. Latin, Greek, and French, these classic languages taught by his mother for six hours a day. Charles then spent 13 years at Westminster School, where the only language allowed in public was Latin. Now, Latin is a dead language. Come on, somebody. It's dead for a reason. To use Latin every day. Imagine using Latin, if you were a depot. Imagine using Latin to go to the bathroom or to get your lunch or to do your normal things that you do day by day by day. After that, those 13 years at Westminster, he added nine years at Oxford, where he received his master's degree. It was said that he could reel off the Latin poet Virgil by the half hour, Carolyn. He was said to have averaged 10 poetic lines a day for 50 years, Bonnie. For 50 years, 10 lines a day. He wrote 8,900 and 89 hymns, 10 times beloved angel, the volume composed by the only other candidate who even came close, Isaac Watts. Yet, I'd add Fanny, Fanny, Fanny Crosby in there too. She wrote a whole lot of hymns as well, amen? But Charles Wesley shined his light as the greatest hymn writer of the world. He composed some of the most lasting songs, lasting hymns of the Christian tradition. Some of them you know, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, Elder Curry, one of your favorites, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, Jesus Lover of My Soul, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Soldiers of Christ Arise and Rejoice, the Lord is king, and yet some people refer to him even now as the forgotten Wesley. Yet his light shined. Now, I don't mind y'all asking the question, well, pastor, what does this have to do with us and being the light of the world? Because one of those great hymns that he co-wrote one of those great hymns that he co-did was called Jesus, the Light of the World. And for many of us, we sing it at funerals, but I've talked to some of you who said, no, pastor, we sang that in church on regular Sundays. We sung that in my childhood. It's familiar to me. I love that song. And you know what that that uh, chorus says, that refrain, you know how it goes. It says, we'll walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine right. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Somebody help me. Oh, we'll walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine right, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Let your light shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. Amen and amen. Who will ever forget the great hymn that inspires us evermore to continue forward the one that says, this little light of mine, what? I'm going to let it shine. Hallelujah. This little light of mine, well, I'm going to let it shine. 
this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All in my room, well, I'm gonna let it shine, oh Lordy, all in my room. I'm gonna let it shine, all in my room. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. Let us pray, let us pray. Holy God, I thank you for the light shining in each of the lives of these, your beloved ones, your children, one by one. I thank you for the light that shines from this corner, this lighthouse, this uh, this three acre plot of land, oh God, that you put your hand on from the very beginning, from 1972 on. I thank you, oh God, for the light shining in our founders where they began on the corner of 4900 Troy Street as the Garage Church. I ask you, oh God, to continue to inspire us to be lights that shine brightly like a city on a hill. I ask you, oh God, that we would shine for the right and for the best and for the good that will uplift those in this community in a significant and strong way. I ask you, oh God, in this moment and on this day to continue to inspire and motivate us to reach out beyond these walls, to reach out and reach into the hearts of those, those who would come and share this Christian journey with us one by one, one by one, oh God, let us call forth the gifts and the graces, the light and the right from those who have yet to shine it in this place. We'd love for this place, oh God, to have bright shining lights always, not just these, others too, that they may come, oh God, and that we might go out and bring them in. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake. And we all said amen, amen, and amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet.